Welcome to the Naughty Child Podcast. With me, Richard. And me, Polly. I'm the dad. And I'm the daughter. I did everything before I leave. I need to find that bag on my question. Alex Hartley took us off air in Brighton earlier this year. I'm a huge fan of Pepper. We thought we were really funny. So Bobby, I'm doing a <laughs> podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> well, my dog is now called Jimmy Anderson. Oh, well, Manchester Originals aren't through to the Eliminator, so I've got to change that to yeah. Do you cook French food? Like, do you cook frog legs and snails? <laughs> oh, I just lock myself in a procedure room. That Sophie Appleton's the worst. It's like having a child with you when she's on tour. I don't know whether it shows something about me or whether it just shows something a little bit stupid. So Polly, since December 2004, essentially, we have shared the same space. We've shared the same daily lives. And this weekend, it all comes to an end. Thank goodness. (laughs) What a relief. (laughs) Can't wait to get out of this pigsty. (laughs) I'm only joking, obviously. Yes, so on Saturday, I'm going to uh, drive you up to Manchester and leave you there. You're going to ditch me on the street corner. Let Mm. me forage for myself. Yeah, what I was going to say, that intro better have been good because I'm just going to recycle that for like the rest of time. Because yes. over Zoom, that's going to be a nightmare with the delay. I may as well just keep the same one. Yes. Yeah, I didn't know if listeners knew that, that we actually do it new every episode. I really shouldn't. That's like. It's a complete waste of time. Yeah, it's eight time. seconds of my life mm. disappearing. I don't have time for that. Yes. So, how are you feeling about leaving home? Uh, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> No, um, it's weird, like, it didn't feel real until today. I was having a conversation with someone, halfway through the conversation, I was like, I'm leaving home, <laughs> and I was a bit freaked out, um, but like, yeah, it's fine. Um, it'll be one of those things, that, I mean, the majority of people, people have that moment in their life when they, like, leave home, and I think people are fine, so... You know, it should be all right. I think it will just be a bit strange and obviously very different. But, I mean, compared to some people who, like, leave home, I'm already quite independent and I will know the city relatively well. So it's not... Like, it is a big change, but it's not... um, And it's not as big as it could be, I suppose. Yeah, I think think you'll, you'll be fine. Um, it's those of us that are left behind that are oh. struggle. Oh, don't. Well, no, I was saying earlier how I already know that I'm going to cry when you leave me. And I just don't want to like think about that because I like I just know it's going to happen. And I'm prepared for it, but also I just don't need that. But, yeah, it's going to happen know, we'll moment. But, you move on. We'll get a dog or something. <laughs> you will not. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, I'll just, like, rent out my room or something to some dodgy lodger. Mm. Um, but the one question I've had all summer is, is the podcast continuing? Yes, we can do a podcast virtually. As actually, the majority of the world do. Um, yes. A lot of people that have podcasts actually do it virtually. It's rare that you get two people doing it in person, so it will be fine. Um, the next few weeks could just be slightly interesting with... I think it will be okay for this part, but it's doing the interviews, which is slightly more complicated because we're used to just like looking at each other and be like, yeah, you go or whatever. Um, so, so I think we have to be better prepared. I, I do not. I am extremely prepared. You're the one that's unprepared <laughs> when we go into these things. I'd like to point out. So you'll have to do start doing some preparation. Yeah. But then we'll have to kind of coordinate, coordinate yeah. our preparation. Thing. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see. We'll figure it out, I suppose. Yes. Been quite a lot of cricket this week. There has been so much. And actually, I think this is perhaps one of the best domestic seasons. Certainly out of like Rachel Hay and Flint stuff, it's definitely the best domestic season. Brilliant. So shall we start domestically then? Let's go domestic then. Go because despite the fact that you're going to Manchester on Saturday, you went to Manchester yesterday. Yeah, I didn't really plan on it. And it's weird. It's actually, 
I think that's actually made it worse because then I realised I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually going like it's weird. But anyway, yeah, I was doing commentary for the Northern Derby as we kind of titled it because it it is a War of the Roses, but it's also not because you've got Durham, Northumberland, Cumbria, and Cheshire tagged mm. along, so it it doesn't quite work like that. Um, so yeah, that was a really interesting game actually. It was very similar to the Southern Derby. Um, obviously, I didn't follow the Southern Derby at the time, but looking back, they kind of look to be similar games that. Um, well, the Diamonds were bowled out for, I mean, it probably ended up being par, but it was a relatively low total. They got bowled out, obviously, as well. Um, but then the Thunder failed to chase it down. And even though they could have gone up below a runner ball for the entire game, um, they just lost wickets. Um, so at a couple of points, it looked like, oh, well, actually, they'll be fine. But I think, I mean, Thunder's batting has always been a bit of a problem. And when they don't have Emma Lambert, that doesn't help the situation either. Um, yes, Katie Levick, of course, bowled very mm. well, got a fourth, didn't she? Yeah, and um, Phoebe Turner as well, bowled really well. Hasn't bowled much throughout the competition and previous to this only had one wicket, but I think she picked up three wickets in the end. Um, so, yeah, she did really well. Um, and then for Thunder, actually, I was impressed with their bowling. Olivia Bell got four for Hannah Jones, who I just think she's class. Like her economy was amazing. She got a couple of wickets, um, but all this after just coming back from injury, and she's great slipped back into back. form. Great yeah. To see her back, yeah, and then Fee Morris, who's had a great season as well, um, bowled really well. Didn't get any wickets, but was the most economical bowler and just looked unplayable. She's been a great signing, hasn't she? Yeah, I mean, I would suggest probably Thunder's best signing, or one of the the best signings of the season, because. Of course, she lost a lot of contract at Western Storm. Um, but as some things just really worked since she's been at Thunder and her batting and bowling is, has really improved. Yes. Now, Rachel Hill Flint Trophy is coming to a very oh. exciting conclusion. And do you know what? The schedulers won't have been able to kind of predict this or anything. I mean, to some extent, you can see it in time, but even no one knew how the Blaze would do, so you can't mm. really predict anything. But on the final weekend on Saturday, it's going to be first versus second, so Blaze v Vipers, second v the, so, the third v fourth, which is South East Stars and Central Sparks. Yes, and then fifth and sixth, which is Diamonds and Sunrises. Who I mean, no one would have predicted the Sunrises coming sixth so far. Um, and then the dead rubber really between Western Storm and Thunder, because Western Storm are definitely going to finish last, I think now. Yeah. Um, which can I say I did predict at the start of the season I was like Western Storm are going to struggle because they haven't recruited anyone and Thunder will definitely be second to last yeah um, so so yeah it, it looks amazing now Sunrisers um, they've won three in a row Scrivens so I'm, I was trying to think um, how how long did it take them to win their previous three games yeah. <laughs> Is... well yeah and they've never won three and three on the bounce have they ever yeah. won two in a row before I don't think they have. I mean, it's... It, it's unheard of. Yeah. It's a great scrivens. Yes. It, it's, they've done amazingly well. Yeah. Amazingly well. And, um, yeah, so really well done to Grace scrivens. Yeah. And it's nothing's really changed. I mean, no. they, they brought in a debutant who scored a century. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, always helpful. Yeah. That game was mad. I think, well, Loughborough's always been a bit of kind of a... A good place for runs. Um, I've seen a couple of centuries there, but yeah, they, I mean, Georgie Boyce also got a turn, mm -hmm. obviously playing for the Blaze, but yeah, women's cricket heritage is Loughborough. I, I was so glad when they were back. Um, they're also back there this weekend, yes, playing against Southern Vipers. Um, now that's yeah. that's an interesting game, isn't it? Blaze against Vipers, mm. first v second, because if Vipers win convincingly they could go straight to the final yeah if they get the five points but if they lose they could very well not qualify mm. at all yeah um because but, they... i mean this is how close we're talking about the table is it's kind of any possibility is possible if that makes sense yeah and because third is playing fourth mm. then as long as it doesn't rain one of those teams yeah. is going to get four or five points oh. so if uh vipers slip up they could end up falling further down the table and again northern diamonds mm. 
against Sunrisers. I, yeah. I don't think Sunrisers. So it's unlikely do it. that they would, because I think they just needed a couple of wins earlier on in the season. But strange things have happened. Well, yes, that would be so, amazing. I think Sparks are probably in the best position in terms of like they haven't got loads to lose in a way Mm -hmm. because their chances of qualification are okay but also if they didn't qualify it wouldn't be this massive disaster whereas I think if Vipers didn't qualify that would be seen very differently because actually they're I mean they're second in the table at the moment Mm -hmm. so I think I would say Northern maybe Northern Diamonds but Sparks yes and Southeast Stars are kind of in the best sort of situation in terms of whatever happens mm-hmm. it's kind of okay um whereas vipers you would see it if they don't qualify then well firstly that's would be the first time not qualifying um but also yeah they kind of had the best chance out of everyone yes so we'll see what happens i suspect i think the, the vipers, vipers will qualify <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um should we chat a bit about england because i actually want to talk, talk about england this week there's some good stuff to chat about there is yes some interesting selections, mm. some really good performances. Yeah. Um, so we're recording on Thursday evening, mm-hmm. and England have just won the second ODI, so the third yeah. ODI yeah. to win the series 2 0. And um, Maya Bouchier, I Ooh. think we need to have a conversation about. Yes. Because I'm right in saying she didn't get selected at all in the Ashes. No. And suddenly now in this series, she's really one of the main mm. players, it seems to me. Well, yeah, she's definitely taken her opportunity because her form in the 100 was ex- excellent. She was one of the best players. Um, and then, of course, she got the call-up. And I suppose it was a bit easier for her to get in the side with Nat Silverbrunt resting in the T20s. But even coming into the ODIs, she's been fantastic. And scoring 95 today, I was really hoping she'd get, go on to get the 100. But she had a record-breaking partnership with Nat, Silver- Nat Silverbrunt, um, who also we need to talk about in a minute. Um, but I think she's done really well because it's good to see when players get the opportunity and they really seize the opportunity. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens in India in terms of selection. Um, because, yeah, I think selections will kind of fall back to not the traditional 11, but kind of the normal England side. Um so I guess we'll see what happens there. I think with Bess Heath, it was interesting actually today. Obviously, she made her debut as a batter, um, wasn't wicket keeping. I don't know whether she'll get in the side as just a batter. Like her batting is obviously excellent, but I think I don't know. I think when you have the full, like for example, Heather Knight wasn't playing today. Sophia Dunkley. Sophia Dunkley will be back presumably. I guess if they do it based on form, Heath will more likely. But at the same time, when it comes to December, I think when they're going, form doesn't really exist because I suppose they've got the WBBL, but I feel like John Lewis is more likely to go with the traditional, kind of more like the Ashes lineup. You yeah, suspect, it, but... it'll be it'll be interesting, you know, and injuries can happen, well, yeah. so you just don't know. Um, but thinking about the new caps mm. that that have happened yeah. this season. You know, at the start of the season, if you'd have asked me, you know, who's your Who nailed would, on person yeah. to get a cap for England this yeah. year, I'd have said Grace Scrivens. Oh, really? Yeah. And I wouldn't have said Lauren Filer. No, I wouldn't have said Lauren Filer. I wouldn't necessarily have said Bess Heath or mm-hmm. Mahika Gore. Yeah. And yet those people have yeah. gone in there ahead of Grace Scrivens. Yeah, I wonder if we spoke about who we think would make debuts because I definitely thought Danny Gibson at some point. Right. I imagine more in the Sri Lanka series, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I don't think I would have. I definitely not Lauren Filer when she was picked. That was a bit of a shock, but it, I mean, it makes so much sense. She's been player of the series for the ODIs, um, so, and she's done really well. I, I mean, I kind of forgot when it came to the Sri Lanka series that she she hadn't made an ODI debut. Because yeah. in my head, I was like, yeah, but of course she only played the Test match. That's right. Um, but no, she's done really, really well. Um, yeah, now Silverbrunt, different gravy. She's amazing. I mean, she's the best player in the world. She just is. Like, 
<laughs> we saw her get a century, of course, at Southampton. Yeah. Uh, oh, you and then saw she her, went you and got the century at Taunton, at Taunton. as well. Um, and it's just, she doesn't really ever look like getting out. Yeah, she's um, one of those players. Well, she's just on this run of form mm. at the moment. and But she's been on that run of form for years. Like, I think about the 2022 World Cup, when she, in the final, yes. um, she got there when beaten out. It was 100 and something, mm-hmm. I can't remember, 138 or something. But then she conti- she played a couple of games after that and was still not out. For like something that I can't remember the final figure, but it it was crazy, and it's just like she's always had this um, form. So you know, I think that rest did her really well playing mm. playing for the Blaze, having a rest. You know, <laughs> <laughs> well, it worked. Mm. So she clearly knew what she was doing. But um, yeah, no, it's it's good that England turned. I mean, the game at Durham was such a relief. I was like, right, it's fine. Um, and then obviously it was frustrating that it was washed out in Northampton. Um, but I mean, England played 31 overs today and managed to get 273. It's extraordinary. Which is, yeah, extraordinary. It's nine um, and over. Oh my gosh, in an ODI. Um, so yeah, very, very impressive. Yes, and um, you know, certainly it's a an, it's an form of cricket that Sri Lanka need more practice at. Yeah. And to improve on, mm. and you know, in in T Twenty, you can have one very very good player, yeah, who carries the team carry more. It. But with ODIs, you do need everyone to kind of step up. Yeah, and I guess T Twenties, a lot of the time, it kind of can go either way. Um, but I think with ODIs, it's always the best team wins, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, so are we? Yeah. So are we still frustrated with England? Do we still think that they were being <laughs> complacent? I think at the start, like, I still kind of think potentially they were. I think it, that more for me comes from the way it was being spoken about at the beginning. I think it's actually less the actions. It's more, like, I understand playing against Sri Lanka compared to the Ashes. Like, I, I'm not dumb. Like, I obviously understand. Like, and also people care about it differently. Like, as a, like, from a fan perspective, of course I'm going to care more about the cricket against the biggest rival in the peak of summer mm-hmm. compared to pouring down with rain in September against a team who you were expected to beat. Like, I mean, that's natural. Um, but I think, yeah, I didn't really like the way it was being spoken about ahead of the series, which, yeah, I mean, each their own. Um, but I think, yeah, I think potentially there was a little bit of complacency, but yeah. They've and, turned it around on that. I, for me, that's like the important thing. And I guess what you've got at, at the end of that series of games against Sri Lanka yeah. is you've got some players who've had an opportunity to step yeah. up. You know, and I think Mahika Gore is one of them. Lauren Filer is another. Yeah. I think Maya Bouchier is another. Mm. Um, and they've had a chance to perform for England. And that's a, that's got to be a good thing yeah, in yeah. the long term. Yeah, no, I think to be fair, I think the debutants have done have done really well. Um, particularly obviously Lauren Filo mentioned her. Um but yeah, I still think like they need to be kind of wary of in the build up, I wasn't yeah, but that's cricket. <laughs> um so yeah, is there anything else to chat about before we get on to our guest? So we've talked about England, we've talked about um, Rachel Hale Flynn. Okay. Now I think it's time to go yeah. on to the guest. Yeah, so we have another guest, another winner, because we only want winners yes. now. Yes, uh, Callie Moore. Yeah, Callie Moore. Just for everyone who wants to pronounce her name right, it's Callie Moore. Um, <laughs> we spoke about that actually before. I think I've cut it out the thing, but um, as someone who wants to get, I mean, people don't pronounce my name wrong. They just spell it wrong all the time, which I don't quite know how that happens. So I appreciate her letting us know how it's pronounced. Um, yeah, it was great to chat to Callie about a variety of things, 100, um, her kind of stint with injuries, which was interesting to get an insight into because I suppose that's stuff you don't really see or hear about. So enjoy our chat with Callie. Could you tell us a little bit about your cricket story? How did you How did you get into the game? So when I was younger, my dad always played cricket and I would always go to his club to watch, um, as well as my brother. Um, so ever since then, I was about eight or nine, 
and I properly got into like club cricket and that was in London in Greenwich and ever since then I've gone through Kent age groups from under 11s to the women's and that's basically the journey of learning learn from my dad and going through the uh, Kent age groups and now I'm at Stars, and obviously I've got all the opportunities at the hundred. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's been amazing, isn't it? So you you um, so you Greenwich, Greenwich is sorry though, isn't it? How come you ended up at Kent? Greenwich is sorry, I guess, but uh, we moved down into Canterbury. Oh, okay, yeah. A bit later, mm-hmm. um, and I had the choice really to go Kent or Surrey, and I preferred Kent because I knew a lot more people that went to Kent as well. So I stuck with the Kent and. People approach me from Kent to say, "Oh, you need to do this." David Sears. Do you know David Sears? Mm-hmm. He was he was an old Kent coach, and he's the one that what he was the one that got a lot of us like Gray, Scrivens, and Rihanna. He wanted us all to be at Kent, and so we've all gone out through the age groups with each other. So yeah, I was going to say Kent's kind of always been a, a county, particularly for women's cricket, where there are so many players coming through. You think about Charlotte Edwards, Lydia Greenway. Is like historically, it's been very strong. So growing up, did you have role models within that Kent system? Yeah, I did actually. Um, I looked a lot up to Charlotte Edwards and Lydia because I remember meeting them as well, and the coaches use them as a lot for examples of like batting and fielding and like role models and leadership. So I did I did look up to Charlotte Edwards a lot. She was a big part of it. And Laura Marsh, as an off-spinner, she was used an example in that sense. And I looked up to her quite a bit as well. Um, but, but also when I got to watch them play like professionally, and that's when they did our um cat presentations for under 11s uh, yeah wow so so really it's like that amazing schooling in the game isn't it? to be to be part of that tradition in kent and for them to be producing so many top players is is absolutely fantastic so tell me how you how you progress from that into now being a professional cricketer it has been a very long process i must say um it happened i think in 2017 2018 um I had been noticed by, I don't know who's in charge of it, but the school games was a big part of it. I was part of the 2018 school games. So I was with a load of people from different county county age groups and stuff. So that was a big like eye-opener to be seen. Um, and then after that, that was part of that, that was to do with the RDC at the time. So like with the KSL, it was um, an age group below that between a mixture of Surrey and Kent. Um, so I was involved in that process, and that oh, that was a very long time ago. Um, and we were called the Sorry Stars at the time, then not South East Stars. But now they've obviously made it a bit more inclusive, and not just Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So that it was when I got into the RDC. That's what re- it was. Regional Development Cricket, I think it was what it stand stood for. Uh, so that was a big platform for like younger age groups to get that to get that exposure to play high levels or to be noticed for their skills that's what probably progressed me from just playing county age group to a higher level and that development of the southeast stars as well because i started in the academy for the southeast stars and then in that same year they wanted me to play in the actual squad Mm. so that was that was that and then one day out of the blue, so that was 2021, I was still at school. I got a phone call because ADR, I got in contact with Danny Hazel um, saying we need an off spinner. Who do we want? And Danny Hazel got in contact with me. And that's how I got in the 100 the first year. <laughs> and I, got, I notified that the school game, uh, my school game went, oh, I should be chosen to play in the 100. <laughs> so yeah, that was just obviously lucky I know people and at the right place that's amazing tell me what it was like go because um you're from this you're very much from the south you're from you know, Kent from Canterbury to go to the proper north <laughs> a, was that a bit of a, a, a culture shock to be part of that sort of northern environment for those years um yes and no like to actually be there for a month yes but with the with everything being northern and the accents I'm quite used to that as my mother is very northern Oh. so it wasn't too much of a job but she she enjoyed it probably a lot more than me because she could see a family as well <laughs> um, 
but no it was it was really good up north actually everyone was really nice really friendly we all got on and I've made friends for life now so yeah it was a great experience that's good yeah I like it when people from the south go to the north and realize that actually everyone down south is very unfriendly and yeah, everyone in the north <laughs> is very, like, <laughs> yeah. then of course mm-hmm. this year you played with the southern brave and obviously went on to win it which is kind of the dream thing to happen in the hundred but how did that come about was that through connection with Charlotte Edwards and kind of your Kent roots so she got in contact with me um early January actually and said we want you we want an off spinner who can bat eight seven or eight and I was like that's fine I'm ha- that's that, I'm your girl <laughs> um so she got in contact with me then but she said it's up to you whether to go in the draft or not I did go in the draft to see if out of the blue anyone else wanted me I didn't get picked wasn't too upset about it uh and then I got in, then Charlotte got in contact with me straight afterwards saying our um discussion still stands will we want you for this and that role other um regions got in contact with me as well but I stuck with Charlotte so she still wanted me after those few months I was like yeah I want to go to Southern Bray with a new environment I knew it would be a very good team so well as as they were yeah I think you wanted a winner's medal as well that's the (laughs) um and what you know, what an extraordinary tournament uh, that you had. I mean, we'll talk about the final in a minute, but, but tell me through, talk me through a little bit some of the highlights of the uh, of the games that you played throughout the tournament. Oh my god! Um, well, I was very fortunate to play in all of the games, so that was a very big moment for me. Like, oh my god, I've been picked to play every game. It's quite, it's quite emotional to say, think about that. I had it because I was injured for the last year. I had been out due to a back injury for eleven months. So be so being back, um, only just coming back on April, um, coming back now to play in full on all the games and being picked in the first eleven was really like overwhelming for me. But also, it made me thought I've I've done so much to get here. I deserve it in a way. So it was amazing. Um, I must say the first game was very nerve wracking because it we were the first game on. Uh, overall um but getting that first first run out first ball I was like oh I'll calm the nerves now so that was quite a highlight I was like oh done my job um uh playing against the Welsh Fire was quite quite a good few intense games for the girls we did we did lose against them the first time and we just narrowly won the second time but I must say the heart was racing between it for both both those games so yeah that those two were very big parts of the competition for us um and that and the game I got my first wicket that was quite a like I can breathe now um I don't know who that was against I think that was Birmingham Phoenix I think Mm. I think that's Birmingham Phoenix so yeah that that game was quite um that was a good game for us to win um but overall I can't really pick a moment <laughs> apart from obviously winning overall was quite amazing yeah and, and I think as well just that sense of really belonging isn't it when you go into a side which is full of world class world famous as much as female cricketers can be world famous players and you get picked for every game that sort of tells you something about your standing and your status in your career at the moment doesn't it yeah it does I hope it gets off a good statement <laughs> yeah <laughs> a very very good statement indeed yeah yeah I, so of course you got I, because it's a Charlotte Edwards team of course you got to the final <laughs> it's just a rite of passage if you were Charlotte Edwards you're going to get through to your yeah <laughs> um and you we were there by the way um it, it was a it was a great game and we saw you take um three wickets in fact you had the best bowling figures in the final yeah. Uh, which is yeah. just extraordinary. Tell me what's so good about Lords and playing there that you can uh, get such good bowling figures. Well, the fact it was the second time playing that I definitely did um, the better time around that that time. Um, but it was quite extraordinary because with my first ball, I was a bit confused. I was like, is that out? Because <laughs> I wasn't sure with the stumping, as uh, obviously, but that was a very big confident boost. I thought, right, we're definitely in it here. 
I, I just felt really good that day. You know, you have you have that those days like, you know, I'm going to bowl really well here. Um, I'm going to do my job for the team. But we were so also, I was so focused as well. Like I want to win for Anya, mm-hmm. Anya Shrubso, because it was her last game. And I thought we're going to go out here with a bang. Um, and just bowling my, uh, the consistent best ball, really. That was, um, that's where wickets just fell. And obviously they dotted up and we were managed to be on top. So, yeah. It, it was amazing. And I suppose you, I think it was 138 you, you, you set, which is, yeah. It's a decent score, isn't it? But it's not necessarily a winning score. No. Um, so the game was in the balance and, and then you got early wickets, but Jemmy Rodriguez was there all the time. And there was a sense of, while she's there, there's a, there's a danger. A chance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but somehow, and I, I want to know whether this was an actual strategy, you prevented her from having any strike for the whole game. <laughs> So yeah, we noticed that. <laughs> so I just wanted to know, is is was that something that you planned on doing? Because it, fe- it felt like watching it, I was thinking, you know, Jemmy's going to hit out in a minute, but she just never got on strike. And there'd be a, a series of 10 balls. And and then the ninth, the 10th ball would get hit for a single and she'd be back <laughs> off strike again. It was, I just couldn't quite believe it. So was it something that was plotted and planned? Um, it wasn't technically, it wasn't planned at all. We were just focused on bowl well, get wickets and that. But ov- obviously, as the game went on, we kind of realised, right, Jemmy's staying in. She's the stronger batter. We obviously try and prevent her to get as much strike as possible. And then I think it was the fourth or fifth wicket uh, in. We all went, right, Jemmy's a threat here. Just keep her off strike because she'll get, she'll get, um, frustrated and then eventually she, when she does get on strike she'll play the odd shot that will probably go up in the air and luckily it worked and luckily it was off my bowling <laughs> so that was the that was the relief in us and like right we've definitely got this now so yeah and you mentioned about wanting to win for Anya what was it like getting to firstly win with Anya Shrub Soul and, and see her retirement out and get to share such a special moment with like an absolute England legend yeah, it was it was um mind blowing actually the fact that I was watching her in the final for the uh, twenty seventeen World Cup or something. I was watching her, and now I get to play with her and win the hundred with her was quite mind boggling. Um, it's like wow, if you really truly work hard, you can really make it to play with your legends. Um, so yeah, it was really emotional. I I cried at the end. I cried. For the fact that we won but also I looked at Anya I was like that's it that's the last game um but yeah it was uh it was really um quite special actually for the team because I didn't know her personally but just knowing her throughout her career it was so extraordinary as well but, it was and a brilliant ending wasn't it and, and I, I love those endings and I suppose for actually for most people they don't get an ending they they get dropped one day and just never get picked again, <laughs> and, and 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 the end just kind of dawns on them, if you like. But to actually mm. get that ending at Lords on that day, having had the day at Lords back in twenty seventeen as well, was it was just poetic, wasn't it? And um, moving away from the highs of the hundred, we've come back to regional cricket, and it must be really difficult to go from the shortest format existing to the longest format that you can play at domestic women's cricket. How did you find it yesterday just being chucked back into 50 over cricket when you're standing in the field for a long time? It was definitely a challenge. Not only the fact it was more overs, it was one of the hottest days of the year and now the hottest week of the year, which was great. Um, No, it was interesting to be... It was good to be back with the girls again. So it's good to be back with the Stars family. Um, but I don't think we were properly prepared for how intense it will be on the body. We knew it would be hard, but we didn't quite realize how much. We knew we didn't we didn't play our best yesterday, um, but we are aiming to play a lot better. And we now know what to cope. We know we now know what to deal with and how to cope with it, and prepare ourselves in the next few days for the game against the Blaze on the Sunday. Yeah, Blaze looking good. You, uh, but you went to see Blaze, didn't you, play at Edgebaston? I, I I popped in for the last five minutes without paying. 
Um, and uh, it's, uh, they they were, I mean, the big difference there is they've got Nat Brunt playing for them. So she's having a, a rest from England playing T20 and she's playing 50 over for the plays. And she was the real difference there. So um, my hint would be watch out for that Siver Brunt character. She's, she's quite a good batter. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, is it difficult, you know, when you, particularly with a team like South East Stars, where you have a lot of, players either in the England setup or on the fringes that actually one game they're there and perform really well then they disappear off to England then they come back and it's it's very inconsistent is that a challenge because you're not having a regular starting 11 and, and things like that it has it has been a challenge to kind of adapt um to who's doing what and when they come back in someone obviously will miss out after they play potentially a really good game in the last game but that's not what they needed for this game, if you know, if it, you can understand what I'm meaning. Um, so it has been challenging for certain players in particular, but we have learned to adapt a bit more now over these last few months. Um, when those kind of players do come in, so yeah, yeah, and they they can only strengthen you really when when they come in as well, can't they? So that's. Uh... That's brilliant. You mentioned about injury before. Now, last season was was really difficult for you with injury. Tell me about some of the challenges in in coping with that and and the whole rehab that goes around having a a back injury. Yeah, so it was in July I found out I had a slip disc. So that was in the middle of the season, which was a um, sorry, I say slip disc, bulging disc. Okay. Similar to a slip disc. Um so I had to have two epidurals on that. So that was really quite nerve wracking. Um, but I did have a lot of uh, help with the stars and had a lot of, I had a good long few months of rehab uh, with Sarge, bless him. Um, it was mentally, that is the the hardest I have had to, that's the hardest thing I've had to go through for myself personally. Um, because there were some days I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't walk properly. So coming back from that, so be, from being able to not do that for a few months to now back playing on the pitch is so overjoying, um, emotional in the sense of how far I've come after just playing cricket itself of how I got injured to now go back into it. It's like, it is. it will always be in the back of my mind that I will have to be careful, especially when diving. Okay. But it's not going to stop me from doing as well as I need to do for the team. But over the last few months, it was mentally very challenging. Mm. And to cope with that, I surround myself a lot with friends, trying to do as much as I can, um, messaging people or at least receiving messages from them and actually incorporating with them. So, yeah, and just, just doing things and getting outside when I can. That was a big part of it and sticking to rehab to actually get through it but yeah long long process well i mean it, it must seem all worth it now after the the summer that you've had here and you know and the uh, and the winner's medal you've got around your neck so it's absolutely brilliant so tell us about a little bit about your ambitions for the future um well i've always aspired to be to play for england one day that's always been a dream goal whether i make it or not it will be heartbreaking if i never get the chance but i will obviously just try to keep I'll just keep trying and still fall in love with the game either way but now with the competitions like the 100 and other franchises around the world there's obviously those opportunities as well for women if there's not England there's opportunities to still have that platform to play at a high standard of women's level and that's even with international players as well and that's across um around the that's across the whole globe so if not England play for more franchises and just keep playing for the for enjoyment as well I don't want to play just for popularity or anything I want to play because I enjoy it so that's that's a big thing just to keep enjoying the game throughout the years and yeah and there are there are loads of players aren't there who who haven't quite or yet played for England or not quite made the grade for England uh, who are absolutely amazing players and are doing well in in franchise leagues. So I think of Marie Kelly at the moment. It's over in the Caribbean. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, amazing player, not quite been selected for England yet. Could still happen. 
Georgia Adams is another good example, I think, as well, at Southern Brave, not being picked for England. But what an amazing <laughs> pro, what, what, a, yeah. what a cracking player. So I think there are good role models there showing the next generation that you can have a really, really, really good um, career. And, you know, England selection is something that's kind of out of your hands, isn't it? you just got to put yeah. performances for your region and, and see what happens. You know, if there's... If if the the best player in history happens to have your skill and your role, then you, you're kind of stuffed, aren't you? Yeah, can't do much else about that. Yeah, and I guess I suppose now you can actually make a living without having to play for England. Yeah. Um, I guess a couple of years ago that wasn't the case, so the opportunities are kind of endless. And I I'm sure in the next five ten years mm. there'll be so many more things. I mean, there's talks about the new South African domestic league, whether that turns into a franchise tournament or that sort of thing. So it's it's kind of endless, which is, I suppose, quite exciting for players of your generation and then the next generation coming through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've... Like 15 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Yes, yeah, so you've timed your run into the game very, very well, which is <laughs> yeah. brilliant. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's been brilliant to yes. catch up with you. And um, yeah. we just want to wish you all the best for the rest of the season. And we'll be keeping a very close eye on uh, on how you're doing. Well, thank you for that. Thanks for um, having me. Uh, that was great. Uh, to talk to Kalia um, and to have another 100 winner on the pod. Yeah, we always are looking after winners. Um, so next week, we will be back. I don't know if we'll have a guest. We probably will have a guest. Um, we'll have an update will... on your first week away from home. Oh, gosh, yeah. It'll be it'll be a very interesting episode, I think it'll be fair to say. We're not entirely sure how everything, everything is going to work, but... In the meantime, you can follow us on social media. So our Instagram is Naughty Child Podcast and our Twitter is, I do say OO, but I mean zero zero when I say, I did think about this yesterday, I don't know why. Um, OO Child Podcast. 